to the 4 o'clock session. Chris Davis will be talking about binding Android view and data binding. Thank you. Uh, first, thanks for everyone showing up. I know like Chet's got a talk on it right now, so you know, but I'm happy that there's anyone here to remind you what you do that. Uh, so um, my name's Chris Davis, and uh, unlike most people that talk here, I don't work for a specific company. I'm a consultant. Um, uh, I do a lot of work for Augusto, actually, who has a booth out here. Um, they have that display that's showing pictures of that. That's like a Chrome, ad, uh, Chrome OS client that I wrote. Um, I do a lot of work on Android and um, Chrome. Um, my other big client is a company called Intertech that's around here. They do a lot of mentoring, and so I do uh, Android mentoring for them. Um, if you go to my website, you will not find a lot of code stuff there. You'll find a lot of tabletop game stuff there, like Dungeon Dragons, World War Games, that type of stuff there. Um, that's a hobby of mine. But if you're looking for code, my GitHub account, uh, quite, quite a bit of stuff up there, and open source projects I've worked on, and then all my example projects I do for um, my speeches. And then my LinkedIn profile, which I keep up to date, and then if I'm ever posting anything random about coding or gaming, you will see it on Google+. Plus. Um, so I'm going to talk about view and data binding, which is um, a pretty basic concept, but just something that allows you to like not have to um, write a lot of extra extra um, code that you don't really need there. So why would you want to deal with um, view and data binding? Well, first I'd ask you, how many times have you written this? You know, find by ID, uh, just to find, you know, you have to do this pretty much every view you're going to manipulate in your, in your uh, view ID. Or maybe, uh, just setting some text into any view. Um, and then, how many times have you set like an on-click listener or any other, other um, event listener? You've probably done it a thousand times. Um, you know, most of you probably got education, you probably didn't go to you know, computer science classes so you can write this a thousand times. So, what I'm about to show you is like two different libraries that kind of cover um, eliminating some of this code or at least making a lot less uh, time consuming. Um, and one of them has to do with the new Android data binding library that they introduced at Google I.O. this last year. Um, the other one is called Butterknife, which is a library that's been around for a long time. So this is an example project I got up in GitHub. It's called Binding Android. Um, and uh, it's a pretty simple app, but I basically do the exact same thing in like eight different activities. Um, I'll just demonstrate like all the different ways you can do uh, binding. Most of them involve the Android data binding library, and there's one Butterknife one as well. So basically what the app does is when you click on the uh, activity launcher, it will launch activity. It pulls a random superhero I have from a data file. Um, it goes get some information, it has some information based off, uh, Marvel's got like a wiki uh, of all their superheroes. Yanks down uh, information, or, or, that information is in a JSON file um, and uh, displays uh, a little bit of information about the superhero and then some of the activities have a button that will randomize, give you a new random superhero to just kind of show off the dynamic data binding elements. And then there's also a little button, there's a little Avengers button here, I just say whether or not they're an Avenger or not. If you click it and they're an Avenger, it'll say assemble, if not, it'll tell them you're not an Avenger. So uh, I'll try to encapsulate all the different types of uh, operations you're going to do with data binding in this little app. So most of the code you see here is from that app. So here's just, before I go too far, this is an example of the JSON that this, my example app is using. I've got a name, I have an alias, I've got a Boolean value I can test, whether or not uh, they're an Avenger or not. I put the first appearance uh, there because it's something that I've always been fascinated about. Uh, whenever I you know, hear about a new superhero, I always want to know where they first appeared in comic books. Um, and then an image URL so I can demonstrate how to deal with that particular issue because image URLs of images um, can't use a normal data data binding because you don't want to block the UI thread for something. So, before Android data binding, so before Google um, put out their data binding library, there was a couple other libraries that dealt with data binding. I don't know that any of them really were hugely success successful, but uh, actually, one mentioned before I get back here. In this example here, the, the first one I'm talking about is like, you know, you're finding your views and they're setting stuff to it. First library I'm going to talk about only deals with pretty much the top one and the bottom one. Um, binding views and binding them to, and getting them and then manipulating setting event handlers. The new, the new um, framework from Android, or from Google itself, deals a little bit more with the middle one. 
So before, there was Butter Knife. And this is probably my all-time favorite library. It's the first library I included any project. Um, it's done by Jay Morphin, which if, um, if anyone who's been using libraries well you should know who he is, it's from Square. Um, if you were sitting in Daniel's talk about Dagger, um, it's a very similar framework. It used to be called a view injection library. Now they changed it to a view binding library. But uh, it essentially does the exact same thing that Dagger does for, uh, for um, dependencies, but just does it for views specifically and as well as resources. So I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on Butternet because I want to show off um, the Android features. But uh, these are some of the things that Butternet provides for you. And it's quite uh, uh, versatile. And the great thing about Butternet what I show you is that it's not very intrusive. The, Android, the Google stuff I want to show you kind of requires a commitment to what they're trying to do. It requires a little bit more of a distinct design pattern to what you're going to do. Butternet can be added to any project. Um, when I do mentoring, and I go into a team that is, has some of junior Android developers and they're looking for some advice, if they don't have Butternet in there, it's usually the first thing I tell them to put in there. It can be added to any application and clean up any of your code and give you a, just a, not only um, write less code, it's make your, like, your activities and stuff look cleaner um, than, than it would be with all the, uh, um, the handlers and the find by view IDs and just the reduced amount of code you have there. So for example, Flutter Knife here allows you to bind views and you literally just put this, I'll have an example um, after the slide, but literally with one line yeah, and a bind, you basically say that member variable should get this view with this ID. And then once it's bound, it's just it's going to be there for you. There's no find by ID or anything like that. It just it will be there. Another nice feature it has, you can bind it to lists of them. So if you have like a bunch of views that are just kind of related, maybe you have a bunch of views in like you're filling out a uh, you know an address form. You just want to bind all the views into a, like an address collection. You can bind resources, which is very useful, and strings, drawables, colors, dimensions. And again, once the once you um, bound it to an activity or a fragment or a view holder or a custom view, you can bind to any object, you'll instantly get those um, resources um, populating those fields. And you can add listeners with a simple annotation. And uh, important thing to keep in mind with Butternight and, and what I'm talking about in, in, with uh, the Android data binding is these are all this is all tooling for the most part. So it's this is your code being generated for you. It's not necessarily using a runtime library as much. Um, so you can bind a click listener to any any method. You don't have to like you know set an on click listener to this you know on your activity and then have one big on click handler where you have to check the IDs to see what you should be doing, or creating a separate handlers for it. You can just have as many methods as you want on your activity and just bound um, an ID to it. The other thing I find extremely useful is you can bind multiple IDs then to one event handler, um, and there could be situations where you have a, a view where you have a main button that provokes something, but maybe there's other contexts there where you want that same activity to be provoked. And you just keep on appending the IDs you want in there. You can also set some of these as a nullable. So you can put the annotation like at nullable in one of them. You're basically saying this might be bound there and it won't air out, it won't throw an exception if it's not there. So here's like kind of a full example of a butter knife activity. And this is from the example project. You can see up there, um, um, this is kind of the magic call right here, the, uh, this butter knife bind. And there's a couple different ways to bind methods depending on what you're using, if, whether you're binding it to you know, activity or whether you're binding it to a fragment or a view holder. Um, one, I don't want to go too deep on it, but if you're binding to a fragment, since fragments have a little bit different lifestyle, there is a call you have to do, do some cleanup when you're binding to a fragment. But for the most part, it's one call. But then that call is going to bind that, you know, the image view up there, that text view, uh, as well as this um, string up here I use. That's a, I have like a format string in there for string replacement. Um, and then I have this listener I've called here that uh, when you click that button, I will determine whether it's an Avenger or not. Anyone have any questions on Butter Knife? So, the important thing, the other thing I want to mention is a lot of this binding goes from the view out. So, um, in the sense that this activity 
all, all of our learn up goes in the um, Java code. It's in the activity, or it's in the view holder, it's in the fragment. Um, when I get to the Android data bind, this is a lot of that stuff is actually in the XML file. So when you're really looking at these two, you, you could use these two frameworks together, but one of the, one thing I do like about ButterKnife is that it's not really muddying up my XML files. It's all within my view, so I can be using any XML file related to it. But when you get to the other one, it's a little more tied to the, what the XML file is doing. So, like I said, Android data binding is presented to Google I/O. It wasn't. It's still technically in beta, but I've used it for apps. I think at this point it's ready for production. If you want to put it in an app, I think you're safe to use it. <coughs> So, uh, in order to set it up, you have to uh, make sure you're using the, uh, at least 5.0 or higher, but right now, um, I mean, 1.5.0 is stable, so you should be using those, uh, uh, the ethical, the, that Android Gradle build. Um, and then, uh, in your if that's, you put, want that in your top level Gradle script, and then in your app level build, um, Gradle file, all you have to do is enable data binding. And, by enabling this, you don't, you're not like going to break anything. Um, if you enable data binding, normal activities and, and uh, XML files will be just fine. As you can see, you have to change the XML, but uh, that just allows this to happen. And one more thing to note again, this this actual data binding, because most of it, this is in tooling, most of this is in Gradle and Android Studio, that it actually goes back all the way to API 2.1. Not that that many people are writing apps that far back, but maybe you are. Um, there is, it is in the support library, um, so there is some code that is in the support library that, that requires, that, that, that has to be bundled into your app. I'm not sure what components are for that, but again, most of it's in the tooling. So this is the look of a new layout file when you use Android data binding. Um, you can see the top, you, normally you have the top level elements going to be some sort of your parent view. Um, now, though, it's a layout tag. It's almost got like a, and they don't have to be in that order, but I, it looks more like, a, like an HTML file now with your header and your, your body. But uh, so on the top there, you're going to have some tags related to like importing certain variables and importing classes and defining variables. And then after that is going to be your top level layout. So keep that in mind if you're going to add this to an existing project that, again, it's not going to break the project saying you turn it on there, but anywhere you're going to use it, you're going to have to change every XML file that you're going to want to use it on. So it's a little bit more of a commitment if you're going to put it into an existing project. So now I'm going to show you some basic data binding. And this is for data binding that really is only for read-only data. Um, if once you've set these bindings and it populates your view, setting it again is not going to provoke it to like re-update itself. So these are kind of one-way, one-time bindings. Although 90% of the time, you probably only need a one-way binding. If you're like, you know, fetching some data from the server, putting it in an object, and you're presenting it on, on your screen, you know, you're, you're like, in this case, maybe I'm pulling all the marble information down, and I'm gonna put it in a view. That data is not going to change, probably. So this simple data that I'm gonna show you is gonna work just fine. The only, only, when I get to the more advanced stuff, it's mostly for if you want data that's going to change it, you know, during life, the activity's lifetime and you want to make sure that it's always being updated. So to start with data binding, you can use you know, plain old Java object, objects or maybe a Java bean model uh, where you're basically going to have either, if you're going to use the plain old Java object, you have you know, final um, um, uh, member variables as well as you can provide getters. Um, and then so in my example app, I just take an XML file and I use um, JSON to like serialize it to this object here. Um, and so then it's populated. It's got you know, all the same data there. Um, and then when you, in re reference to your XML file, you simply define the, the, uh, the name of your variable, what are called superhero, and then you define the type of it, which is basically your class that you've created in your project. This uh, type here is kind of, I shortened it out. Um, it's too long for my slide, so there's, it's missing a few class names in there in the path, but um, it essentially is that. So once you define that in the data, then you can start using it in your view. I just say, okay, the superhero name goes here, um, the alias goes in this text view, and so forth. Um, 
this always, I don't know, anyone here doing the Angular development at all? This kind of reminds me of the way Angular kind of works. I feel like they modeled some of this off the way we do data mining Angular. Um, but uh, so that's a very basic example. And every every time you want to use these variables, you got to put it in these uh, in this curly bracket with an at sign in front of it. Otherwise, it's going to just assume it's a normal string as opposed to uh, data binding logic. And actually, once you put something in there, you can use a lot of powerful features in there. So once you defined your uh, your simple object, your um, your Java bean or your plain old Java object, and you've Set up a layout layout file where you import where you define the, that variable name, and you set all the views the, uh, the way you want to set it. All you got to do is bind it. So once you create that XML file and you save it, and you know Gradle starts running, it's going to generate a uh, a binding object, you know, a, a, another Java class that is going to be used for that, and it's specific to that layout file. So depending on what layout file you name your file, the generating binding class is going to have a similar name. You can change those names if you're running into some sort of naming conflict or something like that, but um, for the most part, you know, you, should, you need to name your job with your, your layout files the kind of the name you kind of want your binding class name to be. Um, and then, normally you would do a set content view where you're giving a layout resource file to set the view of your um, activity or your fragment. Or in fragment, you'd be doing it a little differently. But uh, for the activity, you just simply use this data binding utility set content view, you give it the resource ID that you want to set it to, and it's going to return back that data binding um, object that's, that's been automatically created. And then, it looks like this. So, here we have my Pojo activity, and I call set content view with my layout, and you can see it returns back a Pojo bind binding, probably should name that just Pojo, so it's going to bind it twice. But that name is basically said generated from the XML layout file name. And then here I'm just getting a random superhero. I have a library in that example project that just takes a list, a whole list of Marvel superheroes and gives me a random one. Uh, or actually I'm getting a random one right there. And then you just set the superhero on the binding object. And then as soon as you've done that, all the data is going to populate into your XML view. So like I said before, like if you need to change the way the uh, data binding name is, that um, there is a way to do that. So inside that little you know at sign uh, brackets, you can use a lot of Java-like expressions, and uh, for better or for worse, um, you can do a lot of stuff in there. And I don't know if it's the best model to uh, to like put so much business logic into your um, XML file, but you can. Um, but you can use mathematicals, string concatenations, uh, cast objects, use literals. The only thing you really can't use that you would normally use is this super and new. And you can't create new objects in, in there. Uh, there's no this to re reference to. Um, and uh, on some examples I'll follow, I'll use a couple of these. But it's, you know, you have a lot of stuff you can do in those expressions. Is there something that could coalesce? What do you mean? Like, it is term. Um, coalesce, if there's two values, it takes this one, but if this one's not populated, it takes the next one in line. I don't know if you can do specifically that coalesce, but you can, you can have like operators in your thing that says basically if this value does not exist, do this code instead. Coalesce is just a fancy way of doing that without yeah. having to actually do Absolutely. I'll show you one, kind of some, not that example, but an example where you're kind of if then type of situation for it. Yeah. Um, and it's actually right here. So, um, so you can also do imports. You know, I showed this on the first slide when you do imports, um, and including importing like normal Android classes. So here I've imported the view class because I want to use whether or not. I set the visibility of the view. So in addition to setting data, you can set other properties of your view as well. So here, and then you can also use the imports to kind of just simplify your, your naming uh, the types there in case you have multiple types in the same data. I could have two superheroes if I wanted to in this in this view. And, and so by importing on the top there, I import the, uh, the class path name, and then, then, then I can just use type superhero. But the other import here, I've imported the view. 
And so this is this is a normal data binding here. I'm saying, hey, just put the superhero name to this text field. But here I have this other text field which just puts the uh, alias of the superhero. And here you can see I'm doing a string concatenation, so you can do that there. Um, but some piece of superheroes then don't have aliases, so I'm seeing whether aliases is null, and then I'm setting the view based on that whether or not uh, that is uh, valid or not. I think that kind of logic is okay. I, as you can see, I'm just like looking at it, you can probably create some pretty advanced logic in there. And again, but I think that could lead to some poor design if you put too much logic in your layout. Uh, um, you can add res you can, resources can be part of your um, expressions as well. For example, here you might say you might pass in to the uh, view uh, boolean value whether or not you're doing a large view, whether it's in like a tablet or something like that. And then I might use padding accordingly. So you, 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 know, you populate your view, you figure out what, what your displays or your dimensions are, or maybe you're using another resource that's just telling you what, uh, what, to, or, like, what the size of your screen is, and then you use padding accordingly. But the most powerful feature of this is to use kind of like a, a formatted strings. So here, here's my string resource file. I have uh, my uh, string that is uh, used for the uh, first appearance, saying something like Spider-Man first appeared in Amazing Fantasy 15. And I have to find that string replacement, and no, no reason, there's no reason I have to do that in my uh, Java, Java code. Then I can just here just call that, use that string, and say, okay, I'm going to pass it to your name, to your first appearance. I, I found that particularly useful in the applications I've done. The, the one big application is for data binding. So after um, you know setting properties, you need to want to bind events. So you can always bind events in um, Android before just on the activity. You know you can just go to a view and say on click equals some method, and if that method existed in the activity, it would call. So you could you could always do like some really basic data binding, but most of the time you maybe don't want to bind that that to the activity. You may want to bind it to some sort of external handler. So, an example here, I have this class I've created called Avengers. It's got two uh, methods. One of them's uh, uh, assemble, and the other one's not, not, not a member. So basically, it just goes to the snack bar at the bottom of the screen, whether or not they're a proper Avenger or not. And you just import it, just like you would the other variables. And on the onclick handler, you can use an expression. So here I'm saying, is he an Avenger? If he is, call the proper onclick handler. So you can kind of conditionally call different handlers based on what data you've bound to the view. So, images. You know, everything I'm showing you is pretty much been text or Boolean values or some sort of conditional stuff, but images can't block the UI thread when we're dealing with images, so um, how do you handle that? And this is one of the more advanced pieces of data binding, but uh, the concept is all right, binding adapters. Um, this one's a little bit harder to understand, but basically, most of the um, adapters you can use in reference to, they have like a corresponding view method. So you're basically setting, the invis setting visibility, there's a corresponding method in a view, the view class that set visibility. But you can also do something like padding left in the XML, but there's no padding left function on view. So if, you're going, if you have a situation where you want to set a property that doesn't actually have a corresponding view, uh, property on that view, yeah, I use something called a binding adapter, which basically would um, get that value accordingly. And like, if you want to set that value, you have to set all the properties in your adapter. That's kind of a, a you know a, a not very predominant example, but the biggest one you deal with images, where you can't block UI threads. You need to do something on a separate um, thread, and you need to somehow tell the uh, the view the view that it's okay now to bind this very, this data. So in this example here, we create a binding adapter. Um, 
this creates the, uh, you know, if you're doing, a, I don't know if anyone's made custom views where you, you provide um, you know, custom attributes to your views, and so then you can use app dot colon custom attribute for your view. This creates that same situation where you're going to have a custom attribute, you can use custom attributes in your views based on the uh, uh, binding adapter. You need to annotate it with binding adapter, then define what you want to use, use it in the, in the XML. And then once you do that, you can simply um, set uh, the data based on what object you found in the view. So the superhero here, put the image URL. And that's going to get passed in there with the image view. So you can see here I'm using Picasso. You can use any library you want, obviously. But I'm using Picasso here to basically download the, the image and put it in there, and then also put a placeholder while I'm doing it. You can have multiple parameters to these functions, too. So if I needed to, like, say, I want to pass a URL to a, a default URL, um, if, if this one failed, try this one. I, I could just simply define that in my, um, it, as another parameter to my load image function, and then down here I put a comma, I put that second parameter in. So, again, everything I've shown you now, read only, and, and all, everything I'm gonna show you now has to do with objects that are observable. So not only will they set the, the view, the, the, the view that one time, but if you change data in those objects, they'll automatically update the view. So everything that I'm gonna show you ha implements the observable interface, but you shouldn't need to create your own implementation of the interface. There's at least three different ways for you to uh, you create your own observable objects without too much heavy lifting. So these are the, so the options for uh, creating these objects is the first one is to derive from base observable. So there's a base observable class. You derive from that class and it gives you a lot of functionality already built in for it to be uh, detectable by, by the view. Um, the second option you have is to you create an object that has observable fields. And these observable fields inside the object itself will be uh, monitored and if they're changed will be fired in the, in the view itself and will be updated. The third option is to use an observable collection. So there's an observable array list, an observable map, and so instead of creating your own custom object, you just create you know, an array or a map, and you're doing you know, key value or indexing uh, of setting the, of, of those objects, and they're gonna be observable. If a key is set, it's gonna fire off that a key was set, and then in your, in your um, layout file, you, you can uh, index, you know, call it based on an index, like an array. The first two examples I give you, the XML file that I've already shown you doesn't need to be changed. You know, it, it, so you wouldn't need to change any of your logic XML. They're just, by using an observable object, it's going to fire a notification that data has changed, and it's going to repopulate your views. The second object, it needs a, a different XML file um, definition because you're not using an object anymore, you're using I mean, you're not using a, uh, a, a normal you know, object with getters and setters, you're using a, uh, um, you know, a map or a, an array. And if you really uh, need to, you just create your own object that implements the observable interface. So, <laughs> here's my uh, base observable example. So, here I have my superhero observable, except the base observable. So, you have to annotate each all your getter methods with the bindable annotation. And then you also have to use, I wish I would have highlighted this, the notify property changed. And as soon as you create an object based on this, it's going to create some, it's an automatic, the tooling is going to automatically generate some uh, uh, static name keys here uh, so that you can say what property has changed. So you basically, then that's all you have to do. So basically, the only changes from our previous object is to. Uh, create, uh, uh, use the, uh, the binary annota annotation on our, our getter methods and then call notify property change on our setters. And you'd be good to go for uh, any data, data changes. The one negative I don't like, the reason I don't really like this totally because I don't like having force to derive from some other object. I mean, if you need to derive from another object, then you're, you're screwed. Um, I, I much prefer to inject my behavior into objects in, like this instead of have just always have a base object. Uh, I ran into this problem too, I don't know, does anyone ever use Realm? 
for a database, like a, it's a nice data, local database to replace a SQL light, but the problem with it, you have to derive from a realm object for all your data models, and if you don't want to do that, you kind of screw it. So this, this, this way I kind of feel a little more intrusive in my taste. Observable fields. Here's a, a superhero, again, um, object, and instead of having you know, a normal string, boolean, or the other, I just create, create observable fields, and then those make those fields observable. And that's all you have to write for the object. So that's the whole object to, to have this one detect um, uh, changes. It's a little bit different when you set the properties, so instead of just saying you know, name equals string, you have to do name dot set on that object. I like this, though, because, again, it injects the behavior into my into my object instead of having me have to um, derive from a certain object. So I could have already, I could already have an object that does a lot of stuff, and I just want to add a few observable fields to it for my data body purposes. This is an effective way of doing that. And then, again, here's the usage of it. Here I'm you know, getting another superhero at random. So in my app I have a little button that says, you know, get, you hit the button, it will produce a new hero, and so it will change the view to whatever, whatever, whatever random one comes up. And just, you just have to make this a little bit different call here. I just happen to be using my old job being object as my base one to, to set it over. Not the most efficient way of doing things because I have two superhero objects here, but it works for my example. for the observable field. I'm not exactly, I have to look at the list where they're, but it's not just string and Boolean. I don't think it can be a custom object, I think, it, I think there's a list of like 10 or 15 different things. All the primitive stuff? Yes, all the primitive stuff. I think, yeah, you can create your own observable field, kind of derive, derive if you want to actually put an object there, but if you're going to do that, it's So, um, for, again, I just want to say, state that for the observable, the basic observable object and observable fields, no layout changes from what I showed you before. So you basically you just swap these objects in there. Even the one with the observable fields, in the uh, layout file, it's just going to, you don't have to use any special get because you have to use a special set. It's still just going to, you know, superhero.name is going to get the name for that observable field or whether you create an observable based object. The layout file is exactly the way I did it for the uh, read-only version. Observable collections, a little different, but th this you know has the benefit of not having to create any objects or any custom objects at all. And uh, you're basically going to create an object. This, this is exactly where I created an array map. Um, I'm getting my other superhero there, and I'm just saying name alias Avenger for Spirits, image URL, setting it in the map, doing a put. And those puts themselves are going to fire off a notification to the view to populate. And then the XML file for this one's going to be a little different because um, you know, I'm, I'm, importing, I'm importing the observable map and I'm saying that superhero is, is type of this map. This is really ugly, but you got to do this. You can't use this, you know, this escaped greater than sign. I hate just looking at that. Um, and then here you got to use, you know, just like you would for like kind of an associative array type of situation where you basically have to. You have super object and I'm giving a key. And then here you can see you can cast stuff. I had to cast this to a Boolean because you know, it stores them all as just objects. And I'm doing the on click event handler based on you know, this key. It stores an object, pull it out, cast it as a Boolean. So, you know, this is all great and fine, but you know, you, you're going to be using a recycler view at some point, and you're going to be asking, how can I use this in a recycler view? That's always the big elephant in the room when you introduce anything new with views. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do it, or not lots, probably four different ways to do this, but I'm going to show you how I do it. Um, so here's my view holder. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the recycle view, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go into how the recycle view works, but so you can reference this when you, when you uh, get to that point. But uh, again, the layout file doesn't need to be changed at all. 
what I described before to use it in a layout in the review holder. Um, but we're going to use, instead of using that data by utility dot set content view, which is only for an activity, I'm going to use this bind method, which will create more get bindings. If, it, if, if bindings have already been created, you use this bind method, it's just going to turn back to you the original bindings. But if it hasn't been created yet, it's going to, give you, it's going to create the bindings on the uh, views in question. So for example here, here's my, here's my superhero holder. Um, and I have my superhero item binding because my XML layout file was, I just called it superhero item. I just create a local variable of that. I do, uh, I'm, I'm getting in my view holder, I'm getting past the view in as the, as the normal pattern. Um, and then I'm going to bind it to that view. It returns back to me my superhero binding object. Um, data, like data binding utility has other binding methods you can use. Um, not just so like, there's more than just those two to use for, for uh, getting the view of the, the, the binding view object or the, 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 the item, item binding object. And then the adapter, just inflate the view normally. Don't use any binding inflation. And then set the uh, view holder you've already created um, on the, uh, you know, when you bind the view holder. Uh, to uh, the, whoever hero you want to. So here I'm getting a hero at a certain position. So in my example I have here, I'm showing every superhero that I have in a recycler view. And so I'm just getting the hero that recycler, I'm setting that hero to that, that uh, item binding, and it's going to populate the view. And in this example, because I'm just showing them all, I'm not changing them, I'm just using the normal the Pojo uh, superhero object. So here's the whole thing. Here I got an array list of superheroes. On the create view holder, I'm inflating the view normally. On the I'm on bind view holder, I'm setting my my, my uh, object superhero, and then in the view holder itself, that's where I'm binding the view. Does anyone have any questions about the regular view? That's one that's I think the most tricky. No? Okay, no problem. That's why I created the example project. So. Um, So, I'm almost done here, so I just want to talk about button items in your data binding. Um, even though that, you know, I kind of like what Google has done with the data binding, but in context of button knife, I think that if you don't want to take that step to kind of doing all the jumping, the hoops you have to do to set up the data binding, I think button is still a good choice. I really think that it should be used in pretty much any project. It just is, cleans up so much code. I'm a big fan of the library. Um, the one interesting thing about the data binding uh, the way that Google has done, like I said, so much more has been pushed into the XML file itself, and I'm torn on how I feel about that. Um, I kind of like that the butterfly stuff is outside of it. They don't serve the same purpose because one of them is about setting the properties of those views in the XML file. The other one is just about getting those views references into your object itself. Um, but and so the way Android does it, the way Google does it, you have less need to actually find the views to your activity because you're just going to manipulate the data inside the XML file. Um, but I definitely feel that Android, the Android data binding just requires a commitment. You have to, you, you're, you're basically, if you decide to use it, you have to design your model accordingly. Or you're, if you're using some sort of model view presenter framework or model view view M or whatever you're doing for your, for your view framework, your view design, you, you have to kind of plan for that. Um, it gives you a lot of power and it gives you a lot of um, ability to do the XML files, but uh, um, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's a lot more intrusive than Butterknife. So that's kind of my opinion too. I think I would continue to use both. I'm not sure if I would use both in the same project, but uh, depending on the project itself, I, I I don't know that I would go into a new project. You know, if I were going to a company who wanted some mentoring and they said, hey, look at our current project, how can we improve it? And they're pretty far along, I would say, well, let's rip it all out and use Android data binding. I'd probably say, let's use Butterknife and keep what you got going right now. But if we're starting a new application, I would consider using the Android data binding framework um, just to save yourself a lot of unnecessary code writing. So, with that said, uh, thanks for my talk. Uh, or if, if I, I answer any questions you want, but uh, again, there's my contact information. Should you want to, feel free to ask me questions after the session or you know, on GitHub or Google Plus, whatever. Go ahead. So, uh, right now we just show the data running from the model to the view. Right? What was that? Uh, right now we just uh, read the data from the model about there is like uh, editing field, the view has changed, the, the string, the value in the editing text field has changed. Does that also automatically change the model? You mean if 
you change the value of the XML file? No, I mean in the uh, in edit edit answer. I guess he means like a two-way binding, saying the length of the day and hour today is updated whenever it changes on the view, and then once we change the data on the view, it goes back to the I think like I don't know that even anything can define the XML file to say you give me a two-way binding, but you know if you if you're using one of the observables. And that's two-way binding, and or no, it's not two-way binding. It's it, you, you, know, you kind of got a pseudo two-way binding because you can bind the events. So if you're basically saying um, if you had a, a, an on-click event that called something on your view, I could put on-click handlers into my um, data object itself. You, know, you could have handlers, on-click handlers in the same in the same data object. So I could have a super object, and I could have put the Avengers you know, function inside. The the, the click handler's got to be a static method. It can't be a Method, like a class method on the object itself. But by doing that, you could also pass in a parameter of a superhero, and in the XML, you could pass in that superhero. So you could create a two-way data by and basically having the event handler call a method on the superhero object, which changed data, and if it was observable, that would then update your view. So you can kind of create that situation, but you, you gotta like uh, basically create event handlers that manipulate the object, and then when the object, object is manipulated, it's gonna notify the view. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thanks for coming and uh, glad I got some people and some people to go check. <laughs> yeah. I think I saw a cluster of people in the hallway. Sure. When I, when I saw that, that I scheduled that, I was like, oh.